Welcome to the second part of our uh, three-part series of events celebrating National Poetry Month. National Poetry Month's purpose is to celebrate the power of words, have to uplift our minds and heal our souls. Uh, many of us, you in this audience have felt that way hearing your instructor, today's author, Judy Juanita. Uh, she's in, she's uh, worked with her in the past, uh, maybe twice already, and you know, I, I, you know, she's, you know, she's, you know, Oakland. She's old Oakland, as, as one of my colleagues says. You know, I am new Oakland, and you know, like, like I say, like every time I meet somebody, I, I, I had a. You know, I had an, uh, uh, one of my intermediate school instructors with a Black Panther uh, when I was in junior high school, and but I never really understood what it meant until I was in college and I started, started taking African American uh, history courses, and you know, like, and you know, just talking, you know, to Miss Juanita, and just really talking to people like the older people from Oakland, you know, like they, 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 they embody the spirit and character. Of, of the city, which is, you know, social justice and, you know, improving the quality of lives of the people in the city. And, you know, that's something, you know, that, you know, not to say your age, you know, but as, you know, but as, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party, you know, as, you know, these people, you know, leave us, you know, what will we have, you know, besides, you know, you know, what their writings and what they leave behind for us. Uh, so, you know, Miss Juanita is going to read uh, an excerpt from her book, uh, which is Virgin Soul, which is now available in paperback, which is, um, can I say semi-autobiographical? Yes, sure. Semi-autobiographical of her experience of being a female member of the Black Panther Party. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, so, I, I was born in Berkeley, but raised in Oakland, and then went to San Francisco State. So uh, I came to uh, um, Oakland City College, which, was, um, which is now called Merritt College. So I came here in June of 1963, and I was 16 years old. So since I've been here at... Um, teaching here for 25 years in the Peralta Community College District, I've, of course, met a lot of 16-year-olds. So it's not an uncommon uh, phenomenon in the community college system. Some of us either, like I was, were skipped a grade, or some students um, just are more advanced and they come, or some are, have dropped out already and come to the community college system. So I was 16 years old when I started and met up with um, Huey Newton and, um, and Bobby Seale. So I just wanna, wanna just read little parts from the, uh, from the book. I, you know, so this is what the original um, book uh, looks like. Um, and then this is the paper. Excuse me, this is the paperback version of it, okay? So in my class where some of us are looking at the paperback version, okay? So this part sets the scene for it. And uh, Reginald did ask, uh, was this uh, semi-autobiographical? And yes, it was because it's set in Oakland and it's, um, I, use, I used my experiences, uh, many of them, to serve as bookmarks for me in writing the novel. But this character is very different from, um, <laughs> from Judy Hart, which was my name then. And I really want to emphasize that I was um, a worker bee. Anybody know that phrase, worker bee? You know the worker bees, okay? I was a worker bee in the movement. And because of worker bees, there was a movement, you know? And um, 
Oh my gosh, did I? Okay, let me see if I brought what I intended to bring. Let's see if I put it in my, uh, my big, my rolling backpack. Okay, so it starts off. Uncle Boy Boy was a dentist and Aunt Ola Ray was his wife. And I was not their adored child. I was more obligation than kin, their dark-skinned orphan in residence. I had gotten accepted into San Francisco State as a freshman, but my financial resources amounted to my $72 monthly secured social security check. I wasn't about to ask them to support me. It was 1964 in Oakland, California, and the Monday after I graduated high school, I hot-footed over to Oakland City College and registered. Very soon thereafter, I moved to the Berkeley YWCA for $12.50 a week and kept my head attached to a dictaphone at the Alameda County Welfare Department 20 hours a week to earn my keep through school. Thus, one month out of high school, July 1964, I hit Oakland City College's summer session. The powers that be had changed the name to Merritt College and were building a Hills campus, but we called it CIDA, a raggedy, in the flatlands, couldn't pass the earthquake code, stimulating, politically popping repository of blacks who couldn't get to college any other way, whites who had flunked out of the University of California, and anybody else shrewd enough to go free for two years and transfer to Berkeley, their prereqs pre zapped. Other colleges may have been places where one and all rushed to finish, but at CIDA, guys stayed on growing, not necessarily wiser, but hipper. If women stayed longer than two or two and a half years though, they were old meat. I learned fast what I wanted to be. When I got there, Huey Newton had been there a few, old as salt. His girlfriend's locker was next to mine. She and I took tennis and French together and traded notes for Western Civ. I didn't know diddly about the Greeks being invaded by the Romans, but Margaret, whose parents were Greek, knew it like the back of her hand. Our lockers were right next to my journalism classroom where I was always dashing out of the newsroom, fancying myself a kind of cub reporter on a mission around the school. Journalism was exciting, where English 1A was stifling. I, I got used to Huey's high-pitched voice asking me, have you seen Margaret? He was always looking for her. She and I practiced often, lobbing shots in the court and using our mont de jour. Sometimes we walked to her parents' house, a colonial three-story on nearby College Avenue, talking French all the way. They made a strange couple. Margaret was white, tall, and husky-voiced, and had dark hair down to her waist and gushed upper middle class. Huey was short and cute, but street. With his pop-out-of-nowhere demeanor and pointy-toe shoes, he fit my image of a crazy nigga. What I loved was listening to the black intellectuals and the white boys from the W.E.B. Du Bois Club talk. My friends lumped them, all of them together as communists. On hot afternoons, we sat for hours on the front lawn, cutting class or coming back after class just to see if they had fainted from heat prostration. I was there as often as I was in class, but their language made no sense to me. Fair play for Cuba sounded like U.S. volleyball teams going to Havana. Summer session at City was the most exciting time because everybody was there hanging out. The black Greeks from San Francisco State 
and San Jose State picking up the free six units. The students from the black colleges home for the summer and the grads fresh out of high school. To see, be seen, and catch. Everybody ragged down. I had never seen so many fine dudes in my life. My friends and I had a rating system, the x-ray guys. They were the ones who looked clean through your clothes. The bifocals, they studied you to see if you measured up. The four eyes, they studied, period. And the 2020s, just right. Not fresh, but willing. Not snobbish, but particular. And so sure they were going to be somebody. The 2020s were rare. One wanted to be an accountant, not just a bookkeeper, but a certified public accountant. We were so impressed. I saw him years later collecting tolls at the Bay Bridge. Another one never specified what he wanted to be, but he was earnest, polite, and neat. All the trappings of aspiration were as essential as aspiration itself at that stage. And sadiddy, sadid, sadiddy. That word hasn't gotten to Webster's yet. The uppity, light-skinned sadids went to Snooky's for lunch. Snooky's was all plate glass window and striped candy colors. The sadids possessed money, or in lieu of that, yellow, high yellow, sandy yellow, mellow yellow, sandy, mariny, light brown, peach, or caramel skin. The line stopped there. Money for Snooky's regulars meant living in the hills, or for dudes driving a dick car, the Stingray or the Jaguar, and it had to be in red, silver, or white. And MG was okay too. If they didn't have the car, money, or name that signified daddy was a judge, then there had to be realtor, doctor, or lawyer as their parent, or perhaps the mother was a school teacher. And if they weren't cute, which at that time meant keen featured, and if they didn't dress sharp with the blue cotton slacks with the Madras belt and shirt to match, or the gray gabardine slacks with the Jeff shirt and the pullover sweater with the sleeves very full, the guys had to have a wrap, a line that wouldn't quit. You rocking it, baby, from the front to side and all the way back. Thank goodness for those equalizers, the X the unknown factor that makes for resiliency. But the get down place to go was not sadiddy snookies, but dark and dusty Joe Ethel's, the greasy spoon where Percy Mayfield blew the blues and the donuts were as fresh as the milk was sour. I saw Huey occasionally at Joe Ethel's, never on the makeshift podiums with the intellectuals. I didn't hang much anywhere and didn't get around. The first time I heard someone call Mary Jane an aphrodisiac, I imagined that black patent leather, sh leather shoes were some kind of kinky turn on. The students talked sex like medical practitioners, clothes hangers, quinine, horseback riding, liver pools, liver pills, 1,001 ways to get unpregnant, and the corresponding 1,001 ways to get knocked up all over again. If I had taken their word as gospel, I would have thought the plumbing of every student apartment in the vicinity of city was clogged with fetuses. Good grief. Whenever the conversation or eyeballs turned my way, I, biting my cinnamon roll, or better yet, getting up to go to class, assiduously hid my virginity. Even though I had left my aunt and uncle's house. Their home training echoed in my head. We want you to be a virgin, Janice, until you graduate from college. If you're not a virgin, you won't graduate. Once you have sex, you can't think of anything else. <laughs> One night, when it was too late to leave the Y, I ran out of sanitary napkins. I asked at the desk, no one had any. 
another resident offered me a tampon. I can't. I'm a virgin. She looked at me like I was crazy. Seriously, you can't use tampons? Won't they break my hymen? I said. She laughed uproariously. Have you ridden a bicycle, honey? Your hymen's in the wind. <laughs> anyway, in anthro, she said, we learned that virgin originally meant an independent woman who didn't answer to anybody, man or child. Nothing to do with sex, baby. Ever hear of the Virgin Mary? I wanted to choke her, honey. <laughs> honey, baby, just give me a cotex, not a lecture. I was desperate to become part of the 3% at City who transferred to a four-year institution. I had to keep my nose to the grindstone and make it out of there. And anyway, I knew I had a hymen because I could still feel it, honey. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so at any point, if anybody wants to ask questions, please feel free, you know. Yes, sir, Reggie. Yeah. Reggie, are you ever called Reggie or just Reginald? I'm Reggie all the time. Reggie, here we go. Oh, uh, wow. Um, so, wow. Yeah. What can you say? I, I'm really listening to this, like your, your character is going through a lot of situations that many of the students here go through. Yes. And I, I, I want to say, like, what are the, in real life, or, you know, what were your experiences going to see and uh, SF State, and you know, just being a student and compared to here now and then, it's a nice question. Oh, I think that sex uh, was uh, far more um, a testing, um, a, a gauntlet uh, in, in those days than it is now. Um, because because um, in the 60s, and I'm proud to, to be um, approaching my 72nd birthday in July, yes. So this, is, this was a long time ago. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. Uh, but in the 60s, that was, that was the first time in history that women had sexual freedom. In other words, it was the first time that we were coming in contact with birth control uh, that worked, um, as opposed to our parents, you know, the rhythm method, the diaphragm. So women finally, at that point, it's right at that point, were able to say, I want to have sex. And it didn't mean that you might get pregnant and you might have to marry this guy who you didn't even have you know, a deep feeling for, or maybe you had no feeling for. So, uh, so this is, this 63 is right before all that happened. That pill, she begins taking the pill later in the book. Um, so it was groundbreaking to, to have sex. To have sex often meant you're going to have a baby. You're, you're going to have to get rid of it, or you're going to have to have it. And that's, that's a very um, um, serious, life-changing moment for women. So I don't think sex means that now. Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, is that kind of? And, and a lot of this, this that happened in this first chapter, it really did happen. And, and I would like to say also that the copy editor for Viking um, went back and forth with me over the name. And, I, and he said, in the, you know, wherever he was looking, you know, he said, this was called Laney College. And I said, no, it wasn't. And then he said, well, the only other name I have is Merritt College. And I said, no, it was Oakland City College for a while. So I had to go and find information, you know, for him before he would change it, you know. Yeah, so Chris. You. I was just thinking about, um, I love your book. Everybody Thank should read you. it if you haven't Thank already. Uh, I was thinking about um, Snooky's and Joe Ethel's. Yes. Were those walkable from Oakland yes. City College? Yes. Yes, see, because right now, um, BART is there. BART wasn't there. So there was, 
everybody knows where Oakland City College is, not where the Grove Street campus uh, children's hospital. It's a children's, okay, but the building is there. So here's the building, and then here's the other side of the street, which they widened, okay, to make room for BART. Yeah. So it was just right across the street. So there were these two competing um, hangout places. So Snooky's was, that's a real name, Joe Ethel's is a real name. So Snooky's was kind of like the bougie hangout, you know. How big was it? They, they were just, they were both little places. They weren't, you know, they were just little coffee shops. Like this big? No, no, no. Like, what's the one across the street where everybody goes, Kefa? 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 Yeah, they were that, they were that size. Because I was going to say, like, I feel like that's something, it, it feels like there's no hangout spot close to Laney. I yeah. No, it was a hangout spot. Out, and like, yes. Like yeah. That. And the and the, the Grove Street orators, the guys would be lined up all along the street here. Um, <laughs> SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, WB Du Bois Club, um, all the radicals were, were there. Hippies, radicals, and then so here were the streets. So you were back and forth between going and getting something to eat, to drink, so forth, and listening. Yeah. This is a follow up. Because uh, we're talking about like just places like just I, I hear so many times about like redevelopment and 980 and how it basically just changed the dynamic of West Oakland as far as Oakland particularly. And do you, you have any comments to share about like how how was like the name how was the community before before then like how was first social for back then? Okay, so. Um... I have a chapter uh, that kind of speaks to that, and I'll just read maybe a little bit from that. Okay. So what um, pretty much starts off each, each chapter um, is, or what's in many chapters, are references to um, the Vietnam War, which was the backdrop for the book and it's the back, it was the backdrop for those of us growing up in the 50s and the 60s, was this war effort. You know, our friends were getting drafted. The draft was still on. So in the midst of this, um, then here she goes. She has this first boyfriend named Alwood. Not long after he mutilated my copy of Letting Go by Philip Roth, Alwood stood with me as we breathed in the exhaust fumes on the landing from the sooty Cypress Freeway in West Oakland, a stone's throw from the Oakland Army base. We were at my grandma's place in the projects. I took Allwood to Goosey's because I wanted her to screen him. Good old Goosey, my little grandma, the color of peanut shells. She didn't come to the family get-togethers anymore, and all the babies said all the babies made her nervous. But Goosey would tell a body the rough stuff. When the family fussed about my unpressed hair, she had muttered, oh, Ola pitched a shit fit about your hair. Then she just fixed my plate of stewed chicken, rice, and turnip greens. So that's kind of that first paragraph. So everything, all the big events, our backdrop for her story and her emotions. However, throughout this story, then they're talking about the International Day of Protests, which was um, a big uh, thing against the war. And um, so she said, last month, Goosey says to Alwood after she's been introduced to him, last month there were protesters marching all down in here. So there they were in West Oakland marching. And, she's, and he said, oh, that was the International Day of Protest. And she said, didn't look much international to me. Wasn't a colored in the bunch. Okay, okay so we're used to, in, I don't know if my voice, I, I hear echoes here, am I? Yeah, I have a big voice. <laughs> Ed, uh, Tim, I can't remember. Okay, okay, good, good. So, um, yeah, oh, good, thank you. Didn't look much international, Goosey said. Wasn't a colored in the bunch. Always said, oh, they want those ships headed to Vietnam empty. 
and go goosey mutters. War is good for colored. Only time they use us for all we're worth. And always said, don't believe it. She kept on. And here's this re redevelopment angle coming in. I hear they're building us a new post office, the biggest PO in the Bay Area. Don't believe it, Allwood said. It's nothing but a holding cell for niggas. I flinched at the word, even though Allwood used it purely as political discourse, but Goosey didn't bat an eyelash. Allwood said, the man always uses your tax dollars, your land, your neighborhood, and your labor to enslave you. You vote him in to do it. That's true brilliance. You don't let him do it. You ask him to do it. I had heard the rhetoric before, interesting the first time, numbing once I knew the arguments by heart. So she's saying that this is, this is, this is the rhetoric and this is what they learned, you know, in PE classes, which we took, they, they, we call them um, PE classes, meaning political education classes. Some people today ask me, what's the difference between, you know, the active activist movements you see today and then. And I say PE classes, because we all were so eager to figure out what was going on and learn about it, that we studied um, our books during the day, and then we went to PE classes in the, in, in the evening or in the afternoon at somebody's house. You know, and so, so we were very much informed. We knew, like, like she said, uh, I know this argument about you know, you you don't really uh, um, utilize democracy in the best way. You just vote in who looks like a good candidate. You know, so so does that kind of begin to answer some of what they were thinking about? I mean, it, it, there's more of it. Oh yes, okay, yeah. So you like mentioned kind of uh, how Huey was kind of like street, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I've heard that the Panthers didn't initially form as a like a radical organization. It was more of just a response to police violence. Not that, I mean, combating police violence is inherently radical, but uh, would you say, like, is that true? Or, like, at what time did they necessarily, like, pick up that kind of radical? Like, because I've heard it was post-selling the Little Mouse Red Book, you know? They started selling that, and then kind of it became a thing that they all had to read it. I, I think it's kind of a hard question to answer. I think that, that, uh, that Huey and Bobby developed out of the Afro-American Association, which Don Warden was in charge of. And there's, there's information about that in the book, but that's all over the internet too now, thank goodness, the internet of everything. Um, so, um, so they had certainly far more of a black studies, um, uh, let's educate our people, uh, approach and them being starting a black studies course at city at Oakland City is in here also. Um, however, there was a very sharp demarcation point um, around the Betty Shabazz incident, which is pretty much at the halfway point in the book, and that was when the Black Panthers, um, the, the Black Panther Party of Northern California, split from the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Okay. So um, why did they split? Well, one of the reasons was because the Black Panther Party for Northern California were at that time what were called cultural nationalists. In other words, we can, we can change our hair, we can dress differently, we can study um, about ancient African civilizations. Uh, it was, it was far more had that kind of approach to it um, than, the, than Huey and Bobby. Huey and Bobby were political and radical from the start. So I wouldn't agree that it was not radic radical. However, um, the two points converged. Here are the two points that converged. Uh, Mark Comfort went down to Mark Comfort was a community organizer in Oakland, in West Oakland. He went down to uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Missis the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. So Mississippi, he went to Mississippi. And they were organizing um, t for, for the vote 
and the uh, Alame the Lowndes County um, um, party that I can't, I'm trying to get my name straight, but the white section of it, they use the rooster as their symbol. And the rooster, and they put under it, the rooster represents white supremacy. Okay? So then, in order to get on the ballot, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party had to choose a symbol. They chose the panther. And they chose the panther because the panther only attacks um, when it's backed into a corner. Okay, so it was a self-defense um, um, strategy. So um, Mark Comfort came back to Oakland and brought his what he had learned down there. And he asked them, can we use the Panther as a symbol in Oakland for organizing? And they said, sure, anybody can use it, it's free, you know. So that's one thing that was happening. And then the other thing was that in the 60s, in the cities, the urban cities were going up in flames every summer. Uh, Detroit, Los Angeles and Watts, um, Chicago, uh, par parts of New York. So in Los Angeles, then community activists uh, began having community um, patrols, okay, to really police the police, okay, and Huey and Bobby found out about that. That's that's in here. It's it's, it's you, you, he thank thank goodness he's read the book before. <laughs> this is. I was say, I'm wondering how much of this I'm remembering from the book. Yes, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had to be very careful because, um, you know, the first draft that I brought into my agent, um, who have, whose firm f sold the book, he said, ah, you got to go back to the woodshed for this. He said. Uh, you have to get all of this history right. And he said, this book is going to follow you the rest of your life. And I really didn't quite know what he meant at that point, but now I do understand and I understood, you know, more as I, as I went through it. It's a document and it's historical. Um, and we have to leave some kind of history for all that, all the pain and struggle that we went through. So the other, that, so the Mark Comfort thing was on one side and the name, okay? So they were fighting over the name, Black Panthers, okay? And the Panthers basically told the cultural nationalists, you paper Panthers, get out of here. And, um, and so um, cultural nationalists went one way and, um, and the Black Panthers went another way, pick up the gun. Huey even said at one point, put down the pen and pick up the gun. You know, so now they've come back together, okay? Uh, now people realize 50 years later, 40 years later, that all of this, the Nation of Islam, CORE, the NAACP, the uh, Urban League, um, the Black Panther Party, all of these movements in the 60s were just one spectrum. We were all on one spectrum. We were bringing um, the issues of injustice and inequality and brutality to the forefront. So nobody could feel comfortable with this going on, continuing to exist. I liken it to, um, in another writing, to the 98 pound weakling. Um, so, you guys don't read comic books anymore. We used to, re we used to read comic books, but at the, he, you, maybe you, Joel, maybe you remember, at the back of comic books, there was always a, a Charles Atlas, that's it, a Charles Atlas ad. And, you know, it had this huge globe on it, and there's this little 90 pound, 98 pound weakling on the beach struggling and getting bullied, you know, and then they said, oh, you need to do, be a bodybuilder and build yourself up and then come back to the beach and beat that bully down, you know. So black people and many members of my uh, um, African-American literature, it's my class, no, no, my, of the African-American literature class are here and we've been going over that uh, in W.E.B. -E du Bois's um, Souls of Black Folk and other works. Black people were the 98 pound weakling in the United States of America and the Black Panther Party 
allied by action with all of these other action groups, then the Black Panther Party, though, took direct action. It took direct action. You know, walked up to Sacramento with the guns. Hey, we're here. We're in your face. You know, took direct action and scared the bully. Scared the heck out of the bully. Okay? So the bully then, um, in the form of Cointel Pro, uh, um, uh, destroy, you know, the FBI, Hoover, destroyed the Black Panther Party. Yes, there was plenty of internal contradictions to destroy it, to bring it down to, but they definitely lit the fire. Okay, so, so what's my point? Where am I going? Somebody, come, somebody help me. I got off track. Y'all know I'm 72. I'll be 72. Charles Atlas. Oh, Char Charles Atlas. Thank you. Thank you. So, so once the Black Panthers did that, they changed the way everybody handled oppression. So after the Black Panthers, and there's Grey Panthers, elderly people, okay, after the Black Panthers, there's the handicapped saying, no, don't call us handicapped anymore and fix these curbs and put bathrooms in there so we can come out of the back room. When I was a kid, quote, handicapped people, they had to live in a back room in somebody's house. They couldn't go out of the house. They couldn't go to a restaurant. They couldn't go to an event. You know, now here we are, Berkeley, Oakland, we're the capital, the Center for Independence Living. That was because of the Black Panthers standing up and saying to the bully, no, you've, you've had your reign long enough, long enough, enough is enough, get out of our faces. You know, so then the feminist movement took its, you know, everything got it. When I say, what do I mean? What do I mean? It got its, it's got its heft. It's got, it got its example. It got its courage from the Black Panther Party. That's what a vanguard party does. It's what a vanguard party does. So people ask, oh, was the, were the Black Panthers su successful? And I say, yeah, of course, hell yes. You know, you know, everything's changed. You know, we saved democracy. We saved democracy. So that's the 98 pound weakling. And Charles Atlas was, um, the Black Panther Party, Charles Atlas, black uh, bodybuilder, you know, I, bef I, I can see before I can make that make sense, I'm going to have to get a picture of that, you know? <laughs> yeah, okay. So maybe something else or another question yet? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, how do you feel about being in, a, in the Black Panther Party and there, there were a lot of people who decided to be at home and to not go out and fight for their right? How do you feel, do you feel proud of being part of the Black Panther Party? Or, yeah, how do you feel? Um, first of all, I feel wonderful that I was able to be a part of it. I'll, I'll answer that two ways. There's, um, there's a little section of the book where uh, she, um, she has to, Janice has to go home to her uh, parents um, and, uh, well, to her aunt and uncle and ask for money um, for the cause. Actually, this is 50 some odd years later. A lot of us lived anonymously, okay? That's why I don't begrudge anyone who, um, who was very active and wore their stripes proudly throughout all the decades. Um, but many of us didn't. Um, we weren't hiding, but it wasn't something that we, um, we broadcast. Uh, my, I moved back to the East Coast in 72 and lived there for 18 years. And basically, a lot of people didn't know that I was a Black Panther. And here's why. Um, when they did know, I was treated very differently. Okay. We've become popular. We've become hip. Some students said, Miss Juanita, that word hip is out. Don't use that. But, you know, we've become, you know, kind of like, I don't know, 
what, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, respectable or something, you know? But it wasn't like that. You know, when I got my job uh, working in daily journalism at The Record in Hackensack, New Jersey, um, one of the, I used my experience as, as an editor in chief of the Black Panther paper to back up my resume. Um, and one of the people who became my very best friend um, said afterward, um, she said, Judy, we didn't know what to expect. We thought you were going to come in with guns blazing, you know, and then here I come in, you know, with glasses, you know, walking in, hi, I'm Judy, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that didn't upset me, you know, but it, my close friends knew, my close friends knew, you know, we joke about it, you know, they'd call me things like the Panther Queen, you know, or, you know, so they knew, but it wasn't like I went out with a sign and said, I was a Black Panther, I was a Black Panther. So this book actually, actually did that. But even in writing this book, this kind of is an oblique way to answer your question. Um, the first, uh, um, what do you call this? The first um, bio here, look how it doesn't really say that it's semi-autobiographical. Judy Juanita's poetry and fiction have been published widely, and her plays have been produced in the Bay Area in New York City. A native Californian, she lived for nearly two decades in New Jersey, where she worked as a poet in the schools and as a reporter for the record. blah de blah blah um, You know, this is her first novel. Doesn't mention that I was a Black Panther. And even my ex-husband, with whom I'm very good friends, and we were Panthers together, Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. Anybody know Clarence Thomas? The real Clarence. The real Clarence Thomas. He's a labor leader, an international labor leader. But he said, Jew, that was, that's my nickname. Um, Jew, how come you didn't mention that you were in the Panthers, you know, in, in here when he first got the book? And I said, I don't know. It just kind of was like an omission. So it took me a while to come to grips with the fact that happened. So when the paperback came out, then I corrected that. Um, did I? <laughs> Send them all back. <laughs> I didn't correct it there either. It just, okay, so. Excuse me, got to plug my books. No, I didn't put it on here either. <laughs> okay, plenty of interviews, plenty of interviews. I've corrected it, you know. But so that's why I, when people say I was in the Panthers, first of all, there are only about 5,000 Panthers nationwide. But what we had were um, fellow travelers, fellow travelers. And that was big. Um, and that's what made it the phenomenon that it was. But when, as we used to say, um, and we have a nice uh, adult crowd, except cover her, little, cover her little ears, we used to say, when it goes down, you know, that's who, who shows up, you know, when the, when the police would come knocking on the door, that kind of thing. So just, um, this is about the natural, you know, the natural haircut and Vietnam, okay? Because um, um, the interviewer at, uh, at KPFA, um, he, he said, oh, was, was black as beautiful? Was that really so important? Um, you know, wasn't it, uh, you know, wasn't it all the, the political movement? And I, you know, I tried to, to break it down to him then, but I've had to really develop it as, a, as an essay of how um, blacks had to first overcome intra-racism, okay? They had to deal with, um, with the fact that there was colorism or there was a lot of uh, um, um, negative feeling towards darker skinned black people within the black community. So the, the movement for black pride and for, um, for the natural haircut, for one not to be ashamed of one's Africanness was very important to uh, 
to uplift um, black women, okay, and to open, quote, brother's eyes to the beauty, you know, that was right next to them at that point, even though, even though young women today in my classes write and tell me uh, that that's, that's, that dynamic is still, that, that ugly dynamic is still going on. However, at that time, what it meant was that with that unity, with that unity of, um, of aesthetic, it was an aesthetic unity. In other words, yeah, we're beautiful. We're not ugly, you know. We're your woman. You're our, our man, that kind of thing. With that kind of unity, then we could turn from arguing at one another and then fight, quote, against the man, as we used to call it, the man, you know. So it was necessary. So here's, here's this, um, this part which kind of blends the natural and Vietnam. And this is um, a, 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 a shop that used to be on San Pablo. I went to have my natural shaped at Original Brothers Hairstyling Salon on San Pablo Avenue. The young barber with his sculpted beard and afro kept to the task, commenting on my hair just above a whisper. You need to come every week to keep your fro up. There were brothers in the shop who had goo gobs of hair. I knew they weren't coming every week. Barbershop orators, they held forth. The ladies, cool and silent, flip through ebony and jet. Your hair grows fast, so you know you have to keep it trimmed. Someone asked a loud-talking brother in army green fatigues if he had gotten his clothes at a thrift shop. This is what I wore in Nam before they dishonorably discharged me, he said. Yeah, but you ain't in Nam, bro. You in Oakland. Nam, he said. People need to look this in the face. Yeah. Max, someone said. I catch it on the box. Pff, TV, he said. White folk world sucking his teeth. Keep it neat. Keep it trimmed. So what's the real deal, Mac, someone said. They looked at him scornfully. His hair was unkempt, and he didn't have that Grove Street Marxist rhetoric down. I wore this for three months in Nam, didn't bathe or shave, rinse my teeth with water from a fucking stream. One of the women customers frowned and flipped even faster through ebony. He noticed, that's the way it was, sweetheart. You ain't hitting on nothing, one man said. You sound like Hogan's heroes to me. Everyone cracked up, even the ebony reader. My barber just kept talking low. You got that African bump back here. Your hair would look real good, real short. The vet spoke. How many brothers you know coming back in boxes? People started murmuring. Alphonse, Terrence, yeah, man, Larry ran the 440. Couldn't outrun the Kong, couldn't he? Could he? That's just it. Splibs being put on the front lines, only they ain't getting shot by the Kong. They getting it right in the back from white patties from Georgia and Texas. Oh man, that's ridiculous. A brother in a front, uh, a barber in a front chair said. An another said, do the Vietnamese got prostitutes with razor blades in their pussies only for brothers, like in Germany in World War II when they said we had tails? Even if you don't get it cut, keep your line together. The vet lowered his voice. People paid more attention once he lowered his voice. It's different, I'm telling you. We got more in common with the yellow man than your so-called fellow white Americans. He looked around and picked up a styrofoam cup. It's all different and we can't even see it with our eyes wide open. Man, Dow Chemical makes this stuff polystyrene. This shit you drinking from makes napalm stick to the skin when the bomb explodes. Nam, strictly business for Dow. For Dow. This shit ain't about no democracy. Napalm is some terrifying shit. His voice got loud again. Man, going in there was terrifying. Would you like your baby sister roasted alive to make a big corporation bigger? Fuck that. 
not with God as my witness. Uncle Sam gave me a dishonorable discharge. Shit, give me another one. Hit me two times. Hit me three times. Keep the shape. That's what you want. My barber raised his voice and directly addressed the vet. That's why your broke ass ain't got a J-O-B. Wake up, the vet said. Wake the fuck up. Easing in the front chair. For the next 20 minutes, I looked at the floor, watching his black tufts build in piles, then hills, then rows of hills, until it all became a landscape of hair. The original Brothers Barbershop and Erletha's Beauty Shop were two of a kind. Because my hair grew so fast, and I was used to Grandma or Erletha doing it, I found having a natural took just as much time as a perm or press. But it was a black halo of flowers that had burst open atop my head after a long freezing winter. It stopped traffic, and I loved that. Hmm? <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks. So, um, how many of you have been here to see the, the exhibits um, on the Panthers? Maybe, or you've been to the museum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Billy Jennings, Bill Jennings is, is quite responsible for all that. He's the archivist for the Black Panther Party. So he told me, um, he said, oh, one, uh, we were sitting around talking about your book and one brother said, just turn to page 200, because that's, that's where the Panther stuff starts, you know? <laughs> So it's really, I don't think that's where it starts. I think it's all throughout there, but he, he you know, that's what he was, he was getting at. So um, this is pretty much the turning point in the book, and this will really help my students who are, have to read it. Do I have any students from 1A in here? Some of the one, no, my, okay, they're about ready to start reading it. Um, but it's called um, the, uh, I call it, I call the chapter the Betty Shabazz chapter. So I'm just going to read parts of it. Um, and this is when they go to the airport and uh, meet up uh, these two factions of the Black Panther Party. Allwood came back from Caltech the week after I officially got admitted to San Francisco State. I got a jolt when he walked in the front door because he looked odd. His car coat didn't fit anymore. Allwood, your wrists are sticking out of your coat. Have you grown? He said, I grew almost an inch. In three months? I couldn't believe it. Even my shirt size went up half an inch. I still dug him. That hit me. I wasn't expecting old times. We'd only talked on the phone. The soul sister and the intellectual. The two clouds no longer one behind the other. When he suggested we drive to state so I'd know the way, I didn't say I knew it by heart. Before we left, he asked if I had gotten rid of his dashiki. Okay. Of course not. Do you still want it? Yeah, I want to wear it. He put it on in front of me. It felt strange to see his underarm hair and his arms paler than his face. Are you spending a lot of time in the math lab? Yeah, like a big dog. He put his car coat over the dashiki. You need to dump your car coat in the Goodwill bin, he said to me. Just don't forget your sweater. I said, I don't need it. I had on my pink Levi's, my flat rib poor boy top, and my clogs. It's sunny. Allwood grabbed my sweater on the way out. It gets cold in Frisco, the ocean. I looked at him. I know the city. So they keep going. They go over there. I'm skipping over parts. And... Um, they're driving Chi Things home back to Oakland after they look at San Francisco State. And he starts, um, he points her in the car down the Bayshore Freeway toward the San Francisco airport. Where are we going, I asked, to see Betty Shabazz. I didn't know what he was talking about. We're going to see Betty Shabazz, that's Malcolm X's widow, at the San Francisco airport. She's the main speaker at a program for Malcolm X tomorrow. She's arriving from back east around 1.30. 
Betty Shabazz in the flesh. I couldn't believe it. We left the city past Brisbane and the homes cascading across the hills of South San Francisco in pastel stucco lines. We had passed the bare brown hills with waving grasses when Allwood said, my dad signed the pink slip over to you. He knew we were sharing it anyway. He meant the, their Volkswagen. Um, he pulled it out of his pocket. I didn't know what to say. I hadn't paid a penny for it, but I took the pink slip. Thanks, Allwood. I didn't mention that the bug needed a new carburetor. Nobody had given me anything since high school graduation when Zenobia sent me three dozen yellow roses. My ears had gotten warm then, then, and they warmed as I held the pink slip between my thumb and the steering wheel. They got burning hot. I thought of the word beneficiary. I was his beneficiary, like he had died and gone to heaven and left me a used Volkswagen. It felt good. I turned my mind toward Betty Shabazz. Would she look sorrowful, fierce, happy, proud? I wondered if she'd have on all black. I pictured what she'd worn to Malcolm X's funeral. I pictured the draped black veil on Mrs. Kennedy. I wanted Betty Shabazz's veil to be blacker, heavier, more profound. Malcolm X wasn't in the nation when he died. Had she followed him out, faithful wife? Did she still pray five times a day? I thought of how I would look if I joined the nation, wearing those long skirts all day. <sighs> Janice X, I couldn't picture it. Alwood and I went into the airport terminal, another brother in a dashiki, squinting at the late afternoon sun, stepped between Alwood and me. I thought he was an African tourist until I saw him slap Alwood's hand. Escort the sister back to the car, brother Alwood. I was geared up to see Betty Shabazz, the closest I'd ever get to see Malcolm X, the man himself. She's cool, Alwood told him. No, she's not, the brother said, walking backward, one hand on a rifle, the other held up between us. Stuff just went down. The brothers from the Black Panthers in Oakland almost got into it with the pigs. All three of us seemed to be going in different directions. What's happening, I asked, trying to move toward Alwood. The sister should be at home taking care of her business. He stepped in front of me, blocking me. I walked around him. Sister, I'm sorry, but you're out of line. Allwood turned, impatient with the brother, I thought. Instead, he said to me, Janice, go back and wait in the car. Allwood, uh, wait for what, I said. I want, I want to meet Betty Shabazz. Sister, this is not a tea party. This is life and death. I'm together. No, you're holding your man up and you're holding me up, and that's reactionary. He patted his side like he had a gun there, too. We're ready to protect the lady. I looked up at Allwood, but he was acting like I was something that had dropped out of his nose. I grabbed hold of his sleeve. Tell me this doesn't mean I can't see Betty Shabazz. He shrugged, and the brother said, this ain't the time. Oh, I get it, I said. No, if you got it, you would have got to step in. He turned to leave, and Allwood started walking with him. I stood there fuming. My lips poked out to the air controller's tower. It occurred to me that if I were anybody but Janice Hightower, black girl from East Oakland, I would have been able to see her. Mm -hmm.